This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman in New York, joined by Democracy Now! co-host Juan Gonzalez in Chicago. Hi, Juan. Hi, Amy, and welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. We begin today's show with our ongoing coverage of events marking the 50th anniversary of the other September 11th. That's September 11th, 1973 when the U.S.-backed military coup in Chile unfolded that ousted the democratically elected president, Salvador Allende. He died in the palace that day and led to a 17-year repressive dictatorship of General Augusto Pinochet. On Saturday, the Chilean president, Gabriel Boric, made a historic trip to Washington, D.C., to visit the site where, on September 21, 1976, agents of the Pinochet regime assassinated former Chilean diplomat Orlando Letelier and his colleague Ronnie Moffat of the Institute for Policy Studies for their work to defend democracy in Chile. Letelier had served as Chile's Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Interior and Defense Minister under Salvador Allende. At the time he was murdered, he was director of the Transnational Institute at IPS, a progressive think tank. This is the late filmmaker and author Saul Landau in a video produced by IPS describing the attack and his close friend, Orlando Letelier. We wanted to work, of course, to bring democracy back to Chile and on human rights in general. And both Mark Raskin and Dick Barnett, who were the co-directors of IPS, thought it was a good idea. And we hired him. He didn't stay all that long because Pinochet blamed him for several of the bad things that were happening to Chile as a result of Pinochet's human rights violations. The Kennedy Amendment, which cut off all arms sales and shipments to Chile, and then the Harkin Amendment, which cut off all the rest except for humanitarian aid. And although Orlando was not responsible for either one of these, Pinochet, in his narrow-shaped brain, of course, blamed him. And he ordered the head of the secret police, Manuel Contreras, who was a colonel, to do the job. Contreras, in turn, picked Michael Townley to organize the mission. Nobody who was ever involved with these two people will or could ever forget this horrible day. It was, I remember, a warm, slightly drizzly morning. Orlando's car came to rest just here at the embassy doorstep. Townley had put the bomb at a place in the I-beam where the bomb would blow straight up. Ronnie was sitting in the seat next to him and just took a piece of metal in the throat and that wiped her out. I just felt an overwhelming sense of sorrow and sadness, but I also felt that we have got to get the people who did this. And there was no question in my mind that the only possible suspect was named Augusto Pinochet. But Pinochet never got his name on that indictment with the signature of the U.S. attorney. And that was a tragic blow to a American justice. That was Saul Landau in a film produced by the Institute for Policy Studies, IPS, where Orlando Letelier was working when he was assassinated. The IPS was co-founded by Marcus Raskin, father of Democratic Congress member from Maryland, Jamie Raskin, who addressed the memorial ceremony Saturday at the site of the 1976 assassination in Sheridan Circle in D.C. The event took place a couple of days after independent Senator Bernie Sanders joined Democratic Congress members Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez and others to introduce a congressional resolution apologizing for the U.S. role in the 1973 coup and calling for further declassification of U.S records for related events. Congressmember Raskin spoke after he presented a copy of the resolution to Chilean President Boric. I was 13 years old when Orlando and Ronnie were killed, right here. And I had a message that came to school saying that I should come right home after school. And I was on the bus coming just, well, uh, around here in circle. Um, and we were stuck for several hours in traffic because it was still a crime scene um, at that point, and none of us knew what had happened and what was going on. It was before cell phones took place. But I remember, I remember going to see Michael Moffat that night um, with my parents and um, with the Barnetts, and, uh, and I remember Michael uh, reconstructing the details of what had taken place, 
um, in describing the horror of the explosion in the car. Um, and um, uh, I remember everybody just weeping and not sleeping for days uh, at the loss of, uh, of Orlando, who everybody loved, and Ronnie, who everybody loved, who often babysat for me and for uh, my siblings. And I remember my dad, and I remember Dick Burnett, and Saul Landau, and the other fellows holding a press conference and declaring that whatever else would happen, IPS would find the killers of their colleagues and see that justice was done. And That's Congress member Jamie Raskin, who was also referring to Michael Moffat, who was the husband, in the car, though not killed, along with Ronnie Moffat and Orlando Letelier. Also there Saturday, with two of Orlando Letelier's uh, sons, including Juan Pablo Letelier, a former member of the Chilean Senate, who will join us in a minute from Santiago. This is what he said Saturday. Dear friends, this is a site of cultural memory. This is a memory site that has been built during the last 47 years, led by the IPS. This has been a, a place where the Letlier Market Fund, where Fabulous voices have built a memory site. Hands, struggles, who have built what is here today. We as a family are, are full of gratitude. After Orlando Letelier's son spoke on Saturday, the Chilean president, Gabriel Boric, addressed the crowd. He began in English. I have been to to a lot of acts of remembrance, and um, I, I must confess I am I'm really shaking now. After hearing um, Orlando's sons, after hearing that incredible speech, Jamie Raskin, wherever you are, oh, there you are. <laughs> um, after feeling this energy here, the Washington crying, but all of us here gathered happy and celebrating life, not death. That's an inequivocal way to say that we won, that Orlando's and Ronnie's ideals won. And we are very proud of us, of that. And my generation, I was born 10 years after Orlando was killed. My generation is deeply moved and deeply grateful of the thought they gave, of the life they, they gave to us. As Chilean President Gabriel Boric continued his address, he transitioned to Spanish. Coup d'etats are never inevitable. There will always, always be a space for dialogue, for conversation, for respect of different opinions. Even today, there are many who continue with impunity. And when some people dare to ask the victims to silence their grief, to turn the page, I would humbly like to tell them, having spoken to many of those victims, that this reconciliation is only possible with truth and justice, not with forgetting, and with the profound agreement and deep conviction that this can never happen again. We really expect that the U.S. has a reflection a more deep reflection, and I know that you are doing that, but there's a more deeper reflection on, on what they pushed in Chile, and not only in Chile, in other places in Latin America. That was Chilean President Gabriel Boric speaking Saturday in Washington, D.C., at the site of Orlando Letelier and Ronnie Moffat's assassination. For more, we're joined by Juan Pablo Letelier. 
member of the Chilean House and Senate for 32 years, was in high school when his father, Orlando Letelier, was assassinated with U.S. activist Ronnie Moffat in that car bombing on Embassy Row, September 21, 1976. Uh, Letelier's Socialist Party is also part of President Boric's coalition, joining us now from Santiago, Chile. Um, still, after all of these years, our condolences to you, your family, your country, Juan Pablo Letelier. Thank you very much. So, and thank you for having me. It's great to have you with us. If you can talk about, you know, we heard Congressman Raskin talking about him being 13 years old when your dad was assassinated. Can you talk about your experience at that time? Your father was the Chilean ambassador to the United States uh, until 1973, um, then moved on to be leading critic outside Chile of Augusto Pinochet before he was murdered. Talk about where you were. I was at um, high school. I was, we used to live in Bethesda, Maryland. Went to Walt Whitman High School. I was a senior. I was called over to the dean's office or to the principal's office. And when I got there, he mentioned to me that my father had been in an accident. He didn't give me more details. He only mentioned that my aunt was going to come by to pick me up. A little while after she did, Two of my brothers were in the car with her. I got in the car, sat in the back seat with one of my brothers, Francisco, who asked me if I knew what had happened. And I told him that I did not. And he simply said, they put a bomb in dad's car. They put a bomb in dad's car. We drove down to or into DC to George Washington Hospital. We were listening to news um, briefs or reports of all types, different information, confusing information, one person dead, two persons dead, no information. Mm -hmm. uh, when we got to the hospital, we, there was a lot of people, a lot of press, a lot of confusion. We were kind of hustled in and suddenly we're, we were in a room with my mother. She came to us, she hugged the three of us that were there. And what she said was, the only thing I ask of all of you is that after all this is over, you won't hate anybody. That was her way of telling us that my father was dead. And Juan Pablo Letelier, can you talk about the fight afterwards to, to, uh, to uh, justice for the people responsible and especially the long quest? to hold uh, Pinochet directly responsible? This has been a very long, long fight. The Institute for Policy Studies, Saul Landau, along with a journalist, John Dingus, did a big investigation. They searched for information. They picked up information. The FBI also did its effort. There was a trial initially in the US around 78, I will say which uh, unfortunately, despite all the information being available, they were it was considered a mistrial, amazingly, where um, the Cubans who um, lived in the US, who collaborated with Pinochet's um, police or secret police with the DINA, they were off the hook, unfortunately. They have been identified. Um, this was a big effort through many years. Many human rights workers um, kept struggling to get justice done. Finally, I'd say thanks to many people who pushed this effort. Once we recovered democracy in Chile in 1990s, um, during the second democratic government we had, just on that occasion, the head of the Chilean secret police Manuel Contreras and another collaborator, Pedro Pinoza Bravo, were sentenced and condemned. Previously, the agent who went to the U.S. had gone into a plea bargaining agreement. He had been tried in the U.S. He spent barely five years in jail or seven years after this terrorist attempt in Washington, D.C., the first one that had occurred till then on U.S. soil where an American citizen was also assassinated along with 
my father, Ronnie Carbon Moffitt. Um, but we have been able to advance justice. There are things that are pending. And in the search of that information, there have been wonderful people, incredible people who have struggled in Chile and in the U.S. to get more truth. There's been a wonderful person working at, at the National Archives project, Peter Kornblum, people at the IPS, human rights workers, as I have said in the U.S., who has helped us get more information. There's still some facts which are pending, and we uh, have the confidence that truth will prevail. And we also are very satisfied, allow me to say it, that a group of congressional uh, reps, um, senators, uh, House of Representatives have forward a uh, motion to get history straight, as um, there always were a group of senators and uh, reps who accompanied the cause of democracy in Chile, what is about to be voted in these next days also as part of this administration of justice and creating or getting facts correct. And could you talk about the challenges still facing Chile's Congress and President Boric, the importance of him uh, part participating uh, in the event uh, in Washington? Look, uh, President Boric, as he said when he was there, shared, shared in a circle, was born 10 years after my father's assassination. He is the youngest president we have had in Chile. He is a man who is extremely committed to human rights in Chile and abroad. He has the conviction that no democratic society can exist without full respect of human rights, not mattering if it's a government of uh, one political tendency or another, it can be from the right, it can be from the left, but human rights have to be always upheld. He has stated and maintained that position internationally regarding cases like in Nicaragua or Venezuela or elsewhere. And he has also been very committed to what is happening in Chile in the um, tasks which are still pending. He has uh, announced an initiative that is called in Chile Plan Nacional de Búsqueda. It's a national state guaranteed project or initiative where the government authorities and agencies have the legal obligation to aid all relatives of those who were detained and disappeared and whose bodies have still not appeared. It's more than 1,100 persons. The state has the obligation to help find closure for these families with more truth and more justice. He's a president who is extremely committed with human rights. And we as a family are in particular extremely grateful. I'm sure the um, Carp and Moffat family feels the same, that he has accompanied us or he would have accompanied us last Saturday in an incredible and very uh, um, emotive activity on Sheridan Circle. You were referencing the apology resolution and uh, in the United States um, Congress. Talk more about what that resolution, if passed, the one that oh, Bernie Sanders and Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez and others is supporting, what would that mean? And how did what happened 50 years ago and 47 years ago in the case of the assassination of your father um, shape Chile today? Juan Pablo Letelier. Let, let me state the following. The Church report, the Congressional Church report, um, which was worked through with a number of uh, senators in the U.S. Congress after the military coup in Chile, got part of the facts straight. It stated clearly that there was covert action by the Nixon government against Allende's um, government, first trying to destabilize the government. Um, economically, then politically, financing opposition, financing um, illegal and terrorist acts in Chile. That information is what gave us the conviction that the overthrow of the Yende government probably would not have occurred had it not been for U.S. covert intervention. Now, that is something which still is a wound in Chile. It's a, it is obvious that there was a political conflict in Chile at the time. But what created the condition for the breaking of democracy was this covert action. In the following years, there were many 
brave members of, of Congress who accompanied the Chileans who fought for democracy. Senator Tom Harkin was one of them, Kennedy and many others accompanied us, George Miller um, and many other and, um, House of Representatives. But this resolution which is being put forth today has an additional value. And I think it's very important to uh, underline its importance because it will say, if approved, that uh, Congress as a body recognizes, one, that the use of uh, covert actions is unacceptable, that the use of violence is unacceptable as a mechanism of resolution of conflict of any type. And it states that uh, there's a um, conviction of profound regret of what has happened. It is a way of recognizing U.S.'s responsibility in what happened in Chile, also in other countries. But in the case of Chile, it's very important because what occurred is that the Allende government came to power to a democratic process, a fully democratic process. Chile was one of the most stable democracies in Latin America, in Latin America till 1973. We have recovered our democracy. We're working on it day to day. But to have this statement by National Congress, I think, not only helps to get history straight, it's a recognition of many people, many movements, many actors in the U.S. who do not accept the use of violence internally or externally to resolve conflicts. I think it's uh, an incredible importance, not only for Chile, but I think it's also important for internal U.S. policy, the way we have to, as humanity, as mankind, and within each of our countries, how we have to get things done. And could you tell us in the in a brief few seconds that we have left for this segment, uh, the there was a, a national search uh, plan approved recently by the Chilean government to search for people who disappeared, who were disappeared during the Pinochet dictatorship. What remains to be done in this area? I think the, the importance of um, President Boric's initiative is twofold. Firstly, this is not a responsibility of relatives alone. It can't be that those who are victims are the only ones responsible for looking for their relatives, searching for their relatives, getting information regarding what happened to the relatives, which in the great majority were persons under 30 years of age. The first importance of uh, Borch's announcement is that this will be a public, a state agency responsibility responsibility to search, to, to find, to discover what happened beyond the judicial branch. Secondly, it's a way of recognizing that there's a state responsibility in what occurred. They were state agents, agents of the state, persons who worked for the government, a dictatorship by all means, but for the state at that point, and hence the state will accompany the families, the relatives, till they get justice done. And the trying to find out what happened. Now, we have some versions in Chile of what has happened to some of those bodies, to some of those persons. It's horrific. Some were uh, thrown to the oceans with uh, railroad rails tied to their bodies. There are other uh, versions of some of the corpses or bodies that were uh, uh, unburied at one point, put together and bombed literally the bones to shreds. Um, there are many versions of this tape. That is what has to be set as an official and judicial reality, a story version, so that the families can find closure regarding what happened to their relatives.